Aloha and welcome to Think Tech, raising public awareness about technology, energy, globalism, and diversification. As part of the Think Tech series, today's show is Global Connections, and I'm your host, Carlos Juarez. Joining me today is Tim Murphy, a professor at Kanda University of International Studies in Japan. Uh, today we're going to have a great conversation talking about a range of issues, uh, in particular his long experience teaching English in Japan and uh, just a whole lot of interesting things. So we look forward to this conversation. I want to remind you that we are broadcasting live on the internet, normally at 2 and 4 each day. Uh, all of our shows are streamed on the Ustream.tv and Spreaker.com. If you want to links to those live streams and any of our previous broadcasts, just go to ThinkTechHawaii.com. If you'd like to join us in our downtown studio gallery for any of our live shows, please write to jay at thinktechhawaii.com. We're joined today by Tim Murphy, and Tim uh, is a professor at Kanda University in Japan, uh, teaching, uh, uh, well, you'll tell us in just a moment, but you're certainly one of the leading experts on second language learning, teacher training. So Tim, tell us briefly a little bit about yourself or what it is you do in Japan and, and how long you've been there. Um, I've been in Japan since 1990, mm -hmm. but I left um, two years in the middle of Taiwan. Okay. I was militating against the entrance exam system in Japan. <laughs> And I actually wrote uh, quite a few articles criticizing the entrance exam system mm -hmm. and wrote a novel also about the entrance exam system because mm -hmm. I thought if it could go to the public and the public would be more informed, mm -hmm. then there would be better changes made. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been there for 20 years and I like it very much. Yeah. I love Japan. Yeah. Um, but like a place that you love, you want it to be better. Yes. And yes. so perhaps that's why I'm a little bit um, active in terms of trying to change certain systems that don't mm -hmm. work very well. Mm -hmm. Their job hunting system also, I don't know if you're aware of that, also is a system that doesn't work very well. Uh, students hunt for jobs during their third and fourth year at university mm -hmm. and so they concentrate really well first and second year, third and fourth year, they're, they're, they're hunting for awesome. a job and they're yeah. worried and they want to have a job secured before they graduate and so it's a lot of stress on them and they don't come to a lot of classes sometimes, and mm. so it's like they're only getting a two-year education. Also, that keeps them from going abroad, to study abroad a lot, yeah. because they want to find a job. So the corporate system in Japan is very powerful, yeah. and everyone wants to get a job into the corporate mm. systems, mm. but um, they're hurting themselves, they're shooting yeah. themselves in the foot. Kind of and and I imagine that part of what you're trying to do is a challenge because, I mean, here's a society that's pretty well entrenched and sort of set, a very, you know, culture and norms and, and traditions are very important, and changing those must be quite a challenge. Yeah, I guess it's, uh, the Japan, Japanese are very, very polite. <laughs> you can't yell at somebody in Japan. Yeah, yeah. And you need to be polite. Mm -hmm. And I am polite. Um, and if you politely raise the question, then they might start thinking, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And if we raise the question enough, then it, it might change things. Mm -hmm. And I try and get my students to do that as well, and to mm -hmm. be activist yeah, in yeah, the yeah. same way. Well, and, and of course, I, uh, one of the things that I'd be curious to learn is, as you've been there long enough now to know that, uh, well, to see some changes maybe in, in, in the country itself, but even in the type of students and the issues, um, I, I would wonder if maybe you could step back a little bit, because you described 1990. I mean, uh, what was it that brought you to Japan? How did you get there? Because you're, tell us briefly about your own studies. You found yourself, yeah. as an American, you did graduate studies in Europe, in, in Switzerland. Right. Uh, where did Japan suddenly come into your life? Um, <laughs> I had spent about 15 years off and on in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and I did my PhD in Switzerland uh, on the use of music and song in language mm -hmm. learning, mm -hmm. in applied linguistics, and um, I loved Switzerland very, very much, but once you get your PhD, you kind of graduate out of a, a, a position, if you like, at a yeah. graduate school, and so I was hunting for another position and I met a few Japanese at a conference in England mm -hmm. and I was one of two or three people at their presentation and we started talking and they got interested in me and said I should apply and I applied mm -hmm. from afar and they hired me. Mm -hmm. um, I always had two book contracts at the time with Cambridge and with Oxford. Uh, maneuver myself into that mm -hmm. position. Um, 
But Europe was my starting point, mm -hmm. really. At the, the age of 17, just before my senior year in high school, mm -hmm. I actually hitchhiked all over Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a great inspiration. He'd spent the 1930s um, in, in Europe, mostly. Mm -hmm. And he spoke French and German. And I ended up going yeah. abroad. And he didn't know it. He thought I was going to stay in a youth hostel in Switzerland <laughs> for a summer. Yeah. And a friend invited me to go up into the mountains. I said, OK. And he walked out to the road and stuck out his thumb. And it took you to new And he taught me how places. to hitchhike. Yeah. And so I hitchhiked for six weeks in Fantastic. Europe. It was wonderful. Yeah, and those are things that obviously change your life. It opens new they things. Really and, and you meet people that will yeah. go on to become sort of little points of departure from your plan. And uh, you, you arrive in Japan in 1990. You probably didn't imagine in 2013 you'd be still finding yourself in Japan and, and uh, like you've said it's a place that you've come to probably uh, value greatly or, you know you had a long professional career there um, and as somebody who again has been in this world uh, as, a, as, an, as, you know, as a teacher a master teacher somebody who uh, has worked closely with the population there to learn English and to learn basically uh, you know about the outside world I mean could you share with us a little bit about right now maybe we'll start from looking at some current issues you're, you're doing some exciting research right now could you tell us a little bit about what what what's on your plate at the moment um, at the moment I'm me and my research group in Tokyo mm -hmm. uh, three other colleagues of mine we're investigating dynamic systems theory mm -hmm. sounds a little bit complex it's complexity theory string theory all mm -hmm. these theories they're all kind of grouped together now in dynamic systems theory mm -hmm. um, it's not as complex as it sounds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and at sometimes we're accused of having physics envy the, <laughs> the arts and yeah, sciences yeah, yeah. of course but actually there's a lot of parallels um, and let me just give you a few examples real mm -hmm. quick. Um, a weather system is a dynamic system. Mm -hmm. Bird migration is a dynamic system. And what we developed is looking at a class, a single class mm -hmm. in a university or anywhere else as a system, a dynamic system. But what the difference is, is we can get information from the weather as we regularly do mm -hmm. to live our lives. And information, we can get that about bird migrations and things like that. But we can't give that information back to the weather system or back to the birds themselves. Mm -hmm. They won't change yeah. with that information. But we do this regularly as humans. Yeah. We get economic information about people that are similar to us. We get health information. Mm -hmm. And we hopefully can improve our lives this way. And so what we're calling this is a SINDES, which is a socially intelligent dynamic, dynamic system. system. Wow. And yeah. so suddenly when we start looking at a class as a socially intelligent dynamic system, as a teacher I have to ask myself, well, how much information is this class getting back to itself mm -hmm. about this class, mm -hmm. about themselves, about how they learn, the strategies they learn, the things they have troubles with, yeah. and yeah. so forth. So we've been doing lots of surveys where we get information from them, but we, instead of just keeping it and publishing yeah, it, yeah, you, we you, give it back a, to the students. Stream. Well, this is a very fascinating shift. It's obviously a more active learning experience, and it's engaging the students. And uh, we will continue this conversation in a moment. I want to take a short break, but I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by what you're describing. It's a more rigorous, systematic way of thinking about the teaching, not just a passive, you know, I know and you learn, but really getting some sort of closing the loop and, and having more of a systems approach. We'll take a short break right now and come back. My name is Carlos Juarez. This is Global Connections in the Think Tech radio series. We're talking now with Tim Murphy about some of the opportunities and, and challenges of teaching English and, and, and some of your experience. We'll be back in just a minute, so please stay tuned for more on the story. We want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, 
helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. I'm David Day, the host of Asian Review. This is a Think Tech program in which we take the issues of the Asia Pacific region, whether they be in business, in foreign policy, in national security, or geopolitics. And we take those issues and we try to probe down in some real depth. Maybe it's not always politically correct, but we get to the truth. We do things that the regular media can't do. And the reason that we can do those things is because we here at Think Tech have the contacts, we have the network and we can take the time and explore the issues in depth. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. here at ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm David Day, the host of Asian Review. This is a ThinkTech program in which we take the issues of the Asia Pacific region, whether they be in business, in foreign policy, in national security, or geopolitics. And we take those issues and we try to probe down in some real depth. Maybe it's not always politically correct, but we get to the truth. We do things that the regular media can't do. And the reason that we can do those things is because we here at ThinkTech have the contacts. We have the network. And we can take the time and explore the issues in depth. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. here at ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm David Hi, Day. I'm Donna Blanchard of Kumu Kuhui Theater. And when I was young, I used to love watching Charlie Chan movies on Family Classic TV on Sunday afternoons. Our show at Kumukuhua that runs from August 22nd through September 22nd is called Will the Real Charlie, Charlie Chan Please Stand Up? It's written by Nancy P. Moss and takes place right here in Chinatown. I really hope you'll come in and watch it. You will love it. It's everything about the movies that you loved and more. Go to kumukuhua.org to get more information and your tickets. Hi, thank you for tuning in. My name is Attila Sares and I'm the host for Think Tech Fridays. Join us online 24-7, 365 days a year at thinktechhawaii.com. We're talking about things that matter to Hawaii and around the world. My name again is Attila Sares and I'm the host for Think Tech Fridays. Mahalo. Aloha, I'm Sharon Moriwaki with the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Please join Jay Fidel and me every Wednesday, 4 o'clock p.m. on Energy Wednesday. See you then. Aloha, I'm Sharon. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is our Think Tech News. Apple will hold its iPhone event September 10th, and the rollout of the company's iconic smartphone can't come soon enough. Apple is expected to launch a lower cost iPhone targeted at emerging markets as well as an iPhone 5S. Apple hasn't launched much in 2013 and its board members are pushing for more innovation. Android is highly competitive. Apple has had hit or miss quarters, but a so-so quarter for Apple is ridiculously profitable. Everyone is waiting for ITV or some other smart invention, maybe a smart watch. Piper Jeffries noted expectations for the latest iPhone are low. They said, we believe growth is shifting to the low end and to emerging markets, while high-end smartphone replacement rates are elongating, taking longer. A compelling offering by Apple. And we're back. We're live and we're ThinkTech. It's Global Connections on the ThinkTech radio series talking about teaching English in Japan and some of the exciting things uh, that have been going on there. And Tim Murphy is with me here from Kanda University. Uh, maybe quickly before we continue uh, on some of the work that you were describing, tell us where Kanda is one of the areas right outside J Tokyo, Japan? Actually, Kanda, Kanda is a segment inside of, it's a, okay. inside Tokyo itself. Yeah. And the private uh, group who runs it, the Sano Corporation, they had a Kanda Institute of Foreign Studies for many years, and then in the late 80s, they created a university out in Chiba, ah, which okay. is about 30 minutes away by train. Mm -hmm. And so there they made, they kept the name Kanda, mm -hmm. and called, even though it's not in Kanda, Tokyo, oh, okay. uh, it's in Chiba, Chiba. And it's Kanda in, uh, University of International Studies. Oh. Yeah. And what, uh, what are the programs that you uh, help support there? I mean, you do English language? Uh, English training. language instruction, mm -hmm. English language teaching. They have a graduate school as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, 
Teachers College, which recently just is folding in Tokyo, uh, kind of took it over their, over their library and are continuing their MA program mm -hmm. downtown Tokyo wow, for a TESOL great. program. Great. Well, uh, back to some of the work that you were just describing, because of course, uh, in the teaching environment, you know, we, we often have this image of the, the teacher comes in class, knows everything, and just, you know, kind of inculcates the students somehow, yeah. uh, but uh, you were describing this more dynamic system where you're, you're gathering information, you're trying to see it in a more systems way. Can you, can you continue a little bit of uh, what, describing what, what that involves? Well, it's very Dewey-esque, James mm -hmm. Dewey, mm -hmm. basically experiential learning, the yes. idea that instead of uh, if you want to teach students democracy, you don't tell them about democracy, you let them have a democracy in their class yeah, and yeah, create yeah. one. That's right. So if we're going to be teaching a language, we can learn so much about the students and they can learn so much about each other and that can be the topics mm -hmm. that you actually deal with in the classroom, which is much more interesting than Johnny or Susie yeah. in New York yeah. or London. And it's, it's very, very vibrant in that way. So if we can gather information and give it back to them for them to consider and to correct us yeah. and to do different ways, it's really, really interesting. We have this procedure called critical participatory looping, which uh, in research, basically what we're doing is we're, we may do a survey. Mm -hmm. um, let me give you a quick example. We asked all of our students, what did you really like about your junior high school and high school English education? Mm -hmm. And they gave us all this information, what they liked and what they didn't like. We put it on these columns and we gave it back to them. Amazingly enough, grammar was, of course, in the number one not likes, mm -hmm. but it was in the number two likes. <laughs> so and we couldn't figure it out. We gave it back to them and said, what's, what's going on here? And then they all said, no way could we like grammar. <laughs> it's no way. That's not possible. And we, they pushed us back to look at the data. And we realized we had conflated like with useful in the data analysis, mm -hmm. so when we took away the tag of usefulness, mm -hmm. grammar fell off the charts. Yeah. So anyways, so this is also a way for researchers to do better research yeah. and to check back with their population mm -hmm. and to confirm it. So it's very ethnographic, yeah. Yeah. if you like, where you check with your, your informants mm -hmm. and get their so they information. Help you kind of show where there were some little exactly. maybe glitches, some adjustments mm -hmm. needed. Um, I wonder, and, and again, dealing with classes in that way, on one hand, you're there to help teach English, but you're also then kind of changing the, the, the maybe the, the expectations of them. I mean, you, you have to brief the students, you have to spend some time kind of explaining what you're trying to do, and then probably go through some experimentation to see how it works, how it doesn't work. Um, perhaps from your long uh, experience as, as, as a teacher, uh, can you share a little bit about how things are changed? I mean, here we are now in 2013, we have the impact of technology, the new type of students. I mean, uh, do you see a real difference and what are some of those differences today from maybe some of your earlier time teaching? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Japan is, has, was very, very successful in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. And as we know, success kind of breeds mediocrity mm -hmm. to a certain extent, or at least complacency. Um, we're good enough. We don't need to mm -hmm. change anything now because we're, we're, we are successful. Mm -hmm. And more than Korea, I think, they kind of sat, sat back on their laurels and they were uh, a little bit comfortable with that. But now, I think with more and more people coming through universities with and the young people graduating and seeing how language education can be different, mm -hmm. and then them becoming junior high school and high school teachers, the junior high school and high school system is going to change. Mm -hmm. um, I hope. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. every time a, a student graduates, they join a, a high school faculty, if it's only one person, it's hard for them to change it. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they're very young, and usually they have to follow what the older people are doing. Mm -hmm. And so it really needs a cohort mm -hmm. to join a high school or a junior high school to change them very much. Mm -hmm. um, so there's still that battle. Um, communicative language teaching, of course, was a big wave coming through and people um, paid tribute to it, but it didn't really change a whole lot mm -hmm. in junior high schools and high schools. The big problem is probably the university entrance exam system, mm -hmm. which is still very much mm -hmm. reading-based and translation-based mm -hmm. in some ways. And it's not very reliable system. And high school and junior high school teachers are under the impression that they have to teach to the entrance yeah. exams. Yeah. And they haven't really noticed that the entrance exams have been changing. They're more communicative. Mm -hmm. There's more reading-based, more context-oriented mm -hmm. questions and things like that. 
but the myth that they have to teach grammar translation still kind of hasn't, continues. Hasn't gone away. And yeah. you have uh, shared with us here a, a, a recent novel that you published, The Tail That Wags, and it looks specifically at the entrance exam system. In uh, Japan, of course, this you know, long-standing tradition we have where the students have to work so hard to get in, and then once they get in, they're just cruising, and you know, the university becomes that. I mean, right. how much is that true or myth? Or more specifically, tell us a little bit about this issue of the entrance exam. It, it, they are, universities are trying to change. Um, it, the, whole, the whole way of saying it was hard to get in, easy to get out of university. Mm -hmm. And now, especially with more and more Westerners coming in and more and more Japanese getting their graduate degrees abroad and then coming back, um, the universities are changing and the accountability is rising. Okay? Yeah. Um, but this is augmented, this system, the entrance exam system is, is made worse, if you like, by the job hunting system, mm, okay? Mm -hmm. So, a, when you join a company in Japan, you're joining a family, and they're supposed to take care of you. When you join a university, uh, you got in, you got past the dragging gate, mm -hmm. okay, to get into our university, now we have to take care of you, we have to find you a job. So there's a big department in each mm -hmm. university that helps them Devoted find jobs. Yeah. They do job hunting for third and fourth year, mm -hmm. and that kind of cuts down on the amount of studying they actually do. Mm -hmm. that deteriorates from the quality of what the companies are getting, yeah. okay? Yeah. So it's not a very good systemic way of doing things, yeah. um, but it's the traditional way, and it's the way they've done it for years and years and years and years, mm -hmm. and it's just hard to change yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, there has been uh, recent articles that I've been reading where the Momusho is asking companies not to do job hunting until only the fourth year, mm -hmm. okay? So I don't know if that's going to change things. Yeah, or not. that probably puts a lot of anxiety on the you know the parents that have you know the traditionally right. you do it at the junior year, etc. Right. And uh, I guess the other uh, thing that we often note, and you briefly mentioned the case of Korea, a neighboring country mm -hmm. there, and Korea, you know, in some level like Japan has been experiencing tremendous growth in recent years, mm -hmm. uh, and I know they've done aggressively, you know expanding English language learning, teaching mm -hmm. younger children and so on. Um, would you say it's fair to say that th this change is happening in Korea, the dynamism going there has probably put a little bit of pressure or, or I, I mean, any, in any way reflected in Japan or, or, or does it... The, the Asian governments and ministries of education, they do study each other and they mm -hmm. notice what they're doing mm -hmm. and they, hopefully there's near peer role modeling going on mm -hmm. as uh, to a certain extent. Um, Korea is quite a bit smaller than Japan, though, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like when we compare Finland to the United States. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the Finns have great educational system, but it's a very, very small country. And maybe there's a tipping point going on here. Mm -hmm. When you get too big, it's hard to control yeah, things. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if the one reason there's such a strong Ministry of Education in Japan is it is so big and they want to try yeah, and control yeah, yeah. things, but they can't possibly control things with it being so big yeah, anyways. Yeah, yeah. Um, but maybe it's wrong to try to control things. Maybe they need more of this federalistic yeah, way of looking yeah, at things. Yeah, a little more flexibility. Yes. Now, uh, another dimension of that is, um, you know, the greater opportunities for Japanese teachers, students to get experience abroad. And, and I mean, are, are, are relative to either neighboring countries or other places, I mean, are Japanese getting outside as much or do they tend to probably not get that experience quite as much? The number of students going to, tr to study abroad the last five, six, seven years has been going, going down, down in Japan. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and that's partially because of the job hunting system, the economic mm -hmm. situation, yeah. where it's getting harder and harder to find jobs. But there's also just the complacency a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and. But I think they need to think about this much more strongly about mm -hmm. diversity peering and yeah. bringing in more. And because there are less workers in Japan now, there is a lot of diversity coming in. Yeah. A Pulling lot of foreign workers foreign. coming in because they don't have enough people to work mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And um, at our university, especially our university, our number of students going abroad is going up, up, up each year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it's, a, it's a very international university. We have a lot of foreign students coming in as well. Mm -hmm. And it's a really nice mix in that yeah, diversity yeah. mix. And do you have any, I guess, role in, in helping with English language learning for these groups of foreign workers coming in, or they, do they tend to be in other industrial areas that are outside of yours? I haven't had much contact yeah, yeah. with them. No, I haven't. Mm -hmm. And my impression is that they probably already know English well enough to do whatever they need to do yeah, before yeah, they even yeah. come. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, no, fascinating. Well, um, the other issue I'd like to maybe ask of you, because you've got a, a lot of experience in this area, even your early PhD thesis were dealt with the role and use of music, and, and you know, people who may not be in the English language learning uh, or language learning mode may not realize how important and, and how valuable music can be. Tell us a little bit about both how you got involved and then what are the kind of things that you do to infuse music into your learning? Um, my mother was a elementary school music teacher. Mm -hmm. well, that's a good start. <laughs> that's, that was a start. Yeah. But I was the fifth child, the youngest, <laughs> and so she didn't teach me piano or violin or anything else like my brothers and sisters, and I kind of just watched and sang along. Um, but I started writing songs. Every new chord I could learn on the ukulele, mm -hmm. I would write a new song with it and mm -hmm. make up different songs, and it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And I still make up songs for my students. Um, but I make them very short songs, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and we turn them into song routines very mm -hmm. often. And they become very, very popular with my students, yeah. and we have a really, really good time with them. So part of it is it kind of helps loosen people up, they feel it relaxed, they, they, mm -hmm. it's fun. Mm -hmm. And then from that, believe it or not, you're actually learning some vocabulary. Sure. You're sort of, and, and myself, I think back up, I, I'm a native Spanish speaker, but I also studied quite a bit of French. And some of my early French was learning through songs and uh -huh. music, and I still remember many of those songs. Uh -huh. And uh, um, what are, uh, I guess, uh, in terms of the, the use of music, I mean, do you, uh, what specifically do you do? Do you show them a song? Do you teach them a song? Do you, you know, <laughs> write ones for them? I mean, uh, it sounds like you do a variety. Um, recently, let me give you a little example. Um, I am teaching a graduate school class at a science university, women's, Wyo Women's University of Science, and there's a big group of graduate students who are doing presentations in mm -hmm. English. And I wanted them to make it more lively. Mm -hmm. And so I taught them a very simple song um, about nutrition, mm -hmm. OK? And we put it to the tune, we steal tunes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. something they can Artists connect with. Artists have to tune, of course. have to do it. Um, but basically, if I can sing for you. <laughs> yes, yes, give us a good um, sample there. So trying to get students who are going through the cafeteria line to eat well. Mm -hmm. And they, were, they were, ended up teaching students to sing. Take a little bit of this, take a little bit of that, take a little bit of this, take a little bit of that. Diversify and balance your life. And they, you sing it three or four times yeah. through, and they do the, the, the physical gestures yeah, yeah, and things yeah. like that. And what they notice is that when kids are actually going through the line, they start singing it to, to each other, yeah. and they start remembering, ah, oh, we need to diversify, not just have one big plate yeah, of something, yeah, but yeah. So it, it kind of enjoy. stays in them and yeah, becomes and embedded more. It, it's, um, I did research on what was called the song stuck in your head phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. That tune is a very common <laughs> tune. Gets stuck in your head. I wouldn't be surprised if later after this program I'll you'll be, be singing, singing it to yourself. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it, it reminds you to eat yeah, better. Yeah. And what's amazing after what's amazing is. After I taught this to them, and we did it in a few presentations and so forth, I started singing it to myself every time I was going to lunch. And it just reminds you of, mm -hmm. ah, this is a nice way to diversify my life and to balance things out and yeah, to eat yeah. better. And I'm really unfortunate to teach these nutritionists because they're making me eat better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. Um, but on another level, discourse analysis, which is a big uh, mm -hmm. field in applied linguistics, uh, my PhD dissertation was basically a discourse analysis of the 50 pop songs in 1987 mm -hmm. on the UK hit parade, mm -hmm. okay? And we put this through an old, old uh, computer program, mm -hmm. which basically sorted things out into, uh, what was it? It was scientific discourse, conversation, and narrations. That were the only three mm -hmm. options. Mm -hmm. And we put the songs through just for fun to see what was going to happen. And we thought it was going to come out as a narration, but it actually came out as a conversation. Mm. And it, the reason it came out as a conversation was because it had so many I's and U's in it. But what we realized afterwards is, in a conversation, you know who the I and the U is. In a song, you don't know who the I and the U is. You don't know the time. You don't know the place. Mm. And that's why we started calling songs ghost discourse. <laughs> It's language coming from somewhere, mm -hmm. and it's up to each listener to designate who is the I, who is the you, mm -hmm. the time and the place. The time and the place is usually the time and the place that you're at. Mm -hmm. 
And so when you think back to an old song that you heard in high school, you yeah. start remembering that first girlfriend you had, yeah, when you were and, and where you were. who you were and where yeah. you were at, and that song is time dated for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. But it means something else to other yeah. people. Yes. And that's why uh, I had some friends in Paris who got married a long time ago, um, in the 80s, and they, their marriage song was the Beatles song, Yesterday. Yesterday is a breakup back. song. Yes, it's a exactly, breakup song. Yeah. And it's <laughs> well before the 80s. So. But that's what, was, yeah. that's what they were listening yeah. to when they started dating. And yeah. that was their that song. Was their song. Yeah, that's what it meant to them. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> interesting how you contextualize it. Right, right. Well, what we'll do, and, and I, I want to take an opportunity for a short break right now. Okay. We're going to continue this conversation. I'm Carlos Juarez. This is Global Connections in the Think Tech radio series. Uh, we're talking with Tim Murphy uh, about language learning, about uh, a lot of the exciting things going on and research that he's been doing related to this. And we'll be back in just another minute, so stay tuned for more of the story. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech, energy, and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. And we're back. We're live and we're Think Tech. It's Global Connections on the Think Tech radio series talking about teaching English in Japan and, and uh, your experience there with Tim Murphy. And Tim, uh, one of the things I might ask you right off, uh, we've got a couple of balls in front of us here. And of course what they are, are one of the many little tools of your trade in, in terms of uh, uh, maybe engaging students, entertaining students, you know, helping to teach English. Tell us about this. Um. The juggling balls are basically a metaphor for learning anything, mm -hmm. and anybody can learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and basically, you learn how to just throw one ball as a child, okay? Yeah, it's simple, but life then, is easy. Yeah, it's simple. Then you can add the complexity of two balls and oh, go in different mm -hmm. ways yeah. and do different things. Um, and it also, it's, it's basically teaching my students to fail and to it's let okay. themselves yeah, fail. It's okay up. to make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can't learn how to juggle without dropping the balls. And so you, you drop them over and over and over again, and that's how you learn. Yeah, yeah. And so that's, that's what's so great about them. So that's a great metaphor on that line. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a metaphor in dynamic systems theory just for complexity. Mm -hmm. When you start adding more balls, it gets more and more complex. Yeah, yeah. And I can, you get into a pattern where I, I can juggle three and talk for 20 minutes and it's yeah. no problem now because it's like second nature. Yeah. But if you make me take five balls, it's something that I'm just learning and my, my excitement hormones jump in my mm. body and everything and I get really excited. And so it's also teaching students to push yourself, to yeah. challenge yourself, yeah. to do something that you can't quite do yet. Mm -hmm. and that's how you learn. Yeah. Oh, so it's getting getting on the edge of chaos, if you like. Mm -hmm. And if you get to master five, there's always six. You could there's always, always six. Yeah. And there's always more. Oh, yeah. there's more language. There's more languages. Yes. yes and absolutely. there's always. Hopefully, we can always talk better, even our, in our yeah. native language. Yeah. And, and of course, better. you know, as a expert on language learning, I mean, this is uh, Americans. We often joke or hear jokes about how Americans are more often than not monolingual and, mm -hmm. and assume, you know, why should we learn another language when the global mm -hmm. language is, is English and the world right. is interconnected, but everyone seems to understand us. Um, of course, when you are outside of the U.S. and in other places, mm -hmm. you realize many other people don't have that luxury. And right. if, you, if you're a European, you're likely to speak a few. Even in Asia, you're going to need to know your native tongue, but probably English. Right. Um, what do you see as some of the, I guess, uh, well, the, the challenges of, of, of 
getting people to learn other languages. I mean, here myself as an educator, I mean, we want to say how important it is, and mm -hmm. I'm fortunate I speak some, but it's very hard often to persuade others that it's important to know another language. Now, if you're, as you are in Japan, there's a, a reason they may wish to, because it helps connect them to the outside world. Sure. Uh, but do you also have resistance in a place like Japan? Why should people be learning English? Uh, you know, that why shouldn't others be learning Japanese? Mm -hmm. There is resistance a little bit, but um, yeah, it's they realize they're on an island, <laughs> <laughs> on several islands. Several, yes. Um, but um, there isn't that big of a need for English inside of Japan if you, don't, if you don't move, course. if you yeah. don't leave. Yeah. And that's one reason why I think that we, I think internationally, every 13 year old should go abroad for a year yeah. to another place where they don't speak out the language. Out of your comfort zone, out of your language, out of your everything. Comfort zone, yes. Out of your language. Mm -hmm. And it's just something disconcerting, yes, but it's uh, that diversity is something that's so valuable mm -hmm. to get in touch with. And a lot of my students who do go abroad when they're 13 or 14, mm -hmm. they're hooked on diversity and yeah. they want to go abroad and yeah. they can't yeah. wait to go abroad again and they, they want to get out. Um, they have the travel bug, if you like. Yeah. And, um, but to give that travel bug, I think we need to do it early on and somehow yeah. I wish we could just exchange junior high schools or something yeah, yeah. and send everybody abroad for... Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, on a very micro level it yeah. happens. There are some, again, small number of places that find ways to build these connections mm -hmm. and links at that early age. Because the other challenge of language learning is that we all know it's very hard to learn another language mm -hmm. as an adult. It's right. obviously much easier as a young sure. child. Yes, uh, yes. And I mean, yeah. from your understanding and, and obviously what you know about language learning, I mean, are there some general rules of thumbs where it's much better at you know, or at some point, is there a cutoff point after 12, after 15, or when, when do these breaking points happen? There is this crucial age hypothesis, mm -hmm. um, but now, and now there's research on phonological uh, crucial age hypothesis of going down into infancy, mm -hmm. actually, in one or two years, that if you grow up hearing just the first yep, year yeah. or two, two or three languages, your capabilities later on are expanded, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. and so. Some mothers in Japan are actually playing records and mm -hmm. recordings and everything of other languages for their children now. Yeah. So it's brain feeding, if you like, yeah. which yeah. is really, really important. Um, the other thing that's really, really important is I do research on near-peer role models. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm changing it into diversity modeling. But near-peer role models, what my rec early research was showing was that when I told my students if you call up your partner uh, on the telephone and speak English for five minutes every day, it will really improve your English. Mm -hmm. And it was your friend that you might yeah, otherwise exactly. normally speak in your native tongue. But they wouldn't believe me. Yeah, yeah. They didn't believe me. But if I gave them a passage from a newsletter from someone's action log, another Japanese who mm -hmm. said the same thing, mm -hmm. they would go, oh, this Japanese is doing this. If they're doing it, I could do it. Mm -hmm and then they try it out. Yeah, yeah. So if, an, if the message is actually coming from a near peer role model, yes. it really spreads fast in a certain homogeneous group yeah, yeah. until they get cooked on diversity modeling. <laughs> what is that? So, How does that So for my, peer, let me give yeah. you another example. I, I coordinated a program of content-based instruction classes at several universities and I try to get a teacher to teach about Asian Englishes. What is English like in China? What is English mm -hmm. like in the Philippines? What is yeah. English like there? And usually it's a young Japanese woman who loves traveling around, mm -hmm. who has videos of herself in these different places, who plays them for the students and so forth. And the students typically fall in love with her and her ability to travel to different countries. And mm -hmm. that's near peer role model. Yeah, yeah, but what they're falling yeah. in love with is her love of diversity. Mm -hmm which is one step further and they want to travel then yeah but yeah. it's not it's, it's because of a person that's like them yeah. if it was a foreigner teaching this class it yeah. probably wouldn't work as well. well it goes a long way to connect with somebody yeah. that you can relate to you can see yourself in so, their shoes mm -hmm. so in learning steps we need to go first toward maybe homogeneity a little bit mm -hmm. uh, to near peer role models people who are like me if you can do this then maybe i can do this mm -hmm. um, and then I could start modeling diversity more. Mm 
No, no. Now, technology, of course, we live in an age now where, gosh, all of us depend on smartphones and iPads and uh, computers. And how, how do you, in, in, you know, as a language uh, you know, expert yourself, how do you see this as a tool that, you know, or what are challenges? Because, again, when we deal and teach with younger generations, I mean, they all, they grow up with these. And, uh, yeah. you know, in terms of language learning, what, what, have, what have you seen in your world and in, in this area? Well, way back in the 90s, I was already videoing my students having conversations yeah. with each other yeah. and giving them a, a copy of it on a big VHS yeah, cassette yeah, the old, the old <laughs> where they would school. take it home and watch it mm -hmm. and they would transcribe it mm -hmm. and bring the transcriptions in. I would read the transcriptions. They were supposed to underline what they thought was wrong mm -hmm. and I would underline the other stuff yeah. and give it back to them. And it was a way for them to improve their yeah. speaking. Yeah. Um, the technology is fantastic nowadays. Yeah. We don't need VHS. We don't need yeah. video cameras. They have it on their cell phones. Yeah. They can record a themselves in class. Mm -hmm. We have several people at our university right now who are doing sound recordings like that, mm -hmm. but also video recordings mm -hmm. of different uh, procedures in class for different reasons. Yeah. I don't know if you know the story of the Beatles, though. We're going back a ways. No, no. Um, this I've is heard story. about them, a famous yes, group of from Liverpool. Okay. Yeah. Um, apparently, they, you know, they came to the United States in 1964 and they were deemed overnight successes, mm -hmm. right? But actually they'd been together for seven years. Mm -hmm. And in the early 60s, they, had, they went to uh, Hamburg, Germany, mm -hmm. I think it was, mm -hmm. and they played, I think it was four or five times they went there in these early years, for a month or two months at a time. And they had to play seven or eight hours a night, seven or eight days, no, eight days a week. <laughs> that is their song, isn't it? <laughs> seven days a week for sometimes months at a time. Mm -hmm. And what that was, was immense performing. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm trying to tell teachers now is don't get your students to practice. And I'm telling my students, they always write, oh, I need to practice more. I say, don't practice, perform. Mm. Set up a situation yeah, where you yeah, actually yeah. have to perform it. You have to do it. Mm -hmm. How many times can you have different conversations with different people every day? And then it works. Yeah. And so they do this with their cell phones and they record themselves, but they also arrange to meet different people many, many different times to have these performances. Mm -hmm. So I practice makes perfect? No. No, no. It's perfect, perfect. practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. And perfect practice is performance. Yeah, yeah. It's performing it and making mistakes and that's okay. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. performing. No, trying no. to get them to actually do it in a real situation. Yeah, like the yeah. Beatles were. They got tired and they improvised it's and they made up new songs yeah. and they became great because they had performed over 2,000 times before they got to the States. And, and it, it, it brought in the yeah. need for them to improvise, to have to kind of exactly. constantly change it up a little mm -hmm. or, or, or as you're describing it, maybe perform. And we don't always think of it that way. I mean, indeed, as a teacher yourself, a, a master teacher for many years, ultimately you're a performer. You're someone that has to engage them. You have to right. somehow make it interesting and fun, mm -hmm. uh, fascinating. Uh, and, you know, someone so closely connected with Japanese culture, I mean, often we have that sense of them being very closed and quiet and timid. And, and do you have any particular strategies for how you loosen them up? I mean, you know, maybe the music you describe or other things, but <laughs> any things that have been very effective for you? I would advise teachers to go on and watch a, a Victoria TEDx video mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of Dave Morris and the seven ways of improvisation. Mm -hmm. And for me, those seven ways of improvisation are perfect for teaching. Excellent. Um, he's basically telling us to play, mm -hmm. to allow ourselves to fail, mm -hmm. okay, to listen very carefully. And I think teachers need to listen to students very carefully yeah. in order to figure out how can I teach yeah, yeah. to them more personally. Mm -hmm. But to say yes to everything. And to say, and, yes, and, we can do more. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. typical for improvisation people. And the, the next one was really, really strange. It was follow the rules. We have a structure of our classes. Mm -hmm. We have to give grades, we have to give assignments, we have to do certain things. But within inside of that, we can improvise. Yeah. We can do whatever yeah. we That's want. And most people, <laughs> most people don't know what we're doing. Yeah. But on the other hand, like you said, follow the rules, you need to have some structure. You need to have some structure. structure in place yes, we do need to have some structure. Yeah. We need to have some administration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the last one was relax and have fun. Yes. And hope, I think teachers who do have fun with their classes end up teaching more and learning more themselves and yes. improving their classes as they go along. 
Yeah, no, fascinating. And, and again, these are some things that for some it might come more natural. For others, it's, it's through mm -hmm. learning, through experience, and right. you'll get better at it. Life is improvisation. We yeah. don't know what's going to happen, so we <laughs> need to be ready. Ready to roll with it. Yes. Now, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, getting back to some of your current research, mm -hmm. uh, what you describe these dynamic systems, um, I'm, I'm wondering, are some of these ideas controversial, resisted, or is there somehow, you know, uh, it's bucking the trends, or, or what could you describe briefly about any, uh, I don't know, uh, backlash or any criticism? Are there others who would say, no, 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 Tim's got it all wrong, or, <laughs> or, or somehow uh, way out there? Well, I think traditional, conventional way of delivery of information, if a teacher is in that mode, they're going to not like what I'm saying, mm -hmm. of course, so much. Um, but I, I really am a James Dewey person. I want to give experiences to my students more than let them just hear what I'm saying yeah. and, and yeah. hear my knowledge or whatever else. Um, and, and to a certain extent, that's my performance. If I can get them to perform, I've performed really well. And I feel really good about that. Um, one area that might be interesting in terms mm -hmm. of the critical participatory looping was um, something we did at the, at the end of a survey about a year ago. We asked our students, open-ended question, how do your classmates help you have a, help you be, help you learn more mm -hmm. and enjoy yeah. your, how do they support your learning, okay? And we got 488 comments from this big pool of students, and we, um, it, they really amazed us, and we put them into 16 codes, mm -hmm. okay? And we gave it back to them, and there were things like, well, they, they speak more English to me mm -hmm. in class, they don't make fun of me, and things like that. Um, and we codified all this into 16 codes and gave it back to them in midterm with three questions. Is this really important for your learning? And do your classmates, how much, you know, uh, have your classmates done this this semester? And have you done this this semester? Mm -hmm. We flipped it onto them, okay? And we got some wonderful results back on it. And we also noticed that students were doing something we called um, reciprocal idealizing. This is asking them, what are your ideal classmates, okay? Mm -hmm. how, how do they support you? And what some students were doing was say, were saying, wow, now I know what an ideal classmate is like. Maybe I should do this, mm -hmm. okay? And this is basically, what is the rule, the Christian rule, with the religious rule, the, what do you call it? Uh, uh, do unto others? Yes, or, or, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yeah, it's framed differently by the... It's different, framed differently, uh, different but, it's this, but it's this way of yeah. thinking of, wait a minute. So once they recognize what are the qualities and things that they'd like, then right. suddenly they can begin to... And the golden rule. Yes, yes, But this yes. golden rule, we kind of flipped it, because the golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We first asked them, well, first, what do you want others to do to you? Mm -hmm to help you. And when they identified that, then they started thinking, well, maybe I should be able to do this. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really positive. I carried that one step further in a, in a few other classes at my university and sent them outside of the classroom after giving them instructions about how to shadow and do follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. And I asked them to ask people outside of the class classroom, how do people help you have a great day mm -hmm. and a meaningful life? Mm -hmm. And it's like everybody was kind of stunned. What? What Ooh. kind of question is this? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and it was really, really interesting. And I had them write case studies of their interviews and write down what they were, and then we published them as a right. class publication. Oh. And it was just so wonderful. And yeah. The classes started bubbling with energy and positivity and everything yeah, else. Yeah. No, it took on like yeah. another level. They, it they, really and, did. And, and in some sense, it's a more participatory model. You're not just one way delivering no, stuff. No. You're engaging, you're facilitating their own learning. They're helping others learn. And, right. And that's a very exciting thing. Well, this has been a very exciting uh, conversation, Tim. I want to thank you for taking time to share. You've got a wealth of experience, and, and, and particularly uh, your years in Japan. And uh, um, it's just been great to learn a lot of these insights. I'm, I'm delighted that you could join us here today on Global Connections. Uh, we're out of time now, and we're going to have to wrap it up on this. Uh, I'm Carlos Juarez. Uh, this has been Global
Global Connections in the Think Tech Radio series, and we've been talking to Tim Murphy of Kanda University in Japan. I want to thank you for being here and for you for joining us. Uh, thanks also to our production manager, Ian Davidson, uh, to our communications director, Chrissy Goffigan, and to Jay Fidel, who helps us put it all together here. And to thank you, our listeners, for listening. Think Tech will be back uh, very shortly with the next show in our Think Tech series, so please tune in again. If you'd like to get our daily email and social media program advisories, click the link at thinktechhawaii.com. If you'd like to be a guest, a sponsor, or a Think Tech underwriter, please contact Jay at thinktechhawaii.com. Thanks so much. Remember that we broadcast live on the internet at 2 and at 4 every weekday. All of our shows are also streamed on Ustream.com and on Spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. -E -E if you want links to these uh, live streams or any previous broadcasts, you can go and they're saved on YouTube at ThinkTechHawaii.com. Go there and to our Facebook page and tell them you like us. And of course, I'll see you next week for more Global Connections. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>